three in the process. That is TAPI, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. That is one. Then there is energy as we put our, our uh, very seasoned diplomat uh, from India. And then there is another one, IPI, Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline. Now, a very hypothetical question uh, was raised in one of the presentation that if Pakistan stops, why should Pakistan stop? Because Pakistan is also going to gain out of it, out of the pipeline which runs through it. I mean, this is the trust deficit which is affecting this region since the last 70 years. Until and unless we come out of it, see, there are counter uh, uh, arguments which uh, I can very effectively put. I don't want to raise at this issue at this stage. Because, but keep in mind, the track record of Pakistan and the track record of India as well. The first overflight of Pakistani flights was stopped by India, but it's never been stopped by Pakistan. And I can go on and on, but we have to stop looking at the back. We have to look at the future and we have to move forward. Thank you very much. After the gentleman at the back. Myself, myself, S.S. Bakri from Institute of UN and UNESCO Studies. I would like if the chairman throws some more light on India, Pakistan, um, Iran, Pakistan, India gas pipe pipeline as to where the blunder block bus lies. Because we heard 10 years ago, 8 years ago, it is on the way. Something is going to be materialized, normalized. But still, you know, um, we really don't know what is the current status of this gas pipeline. Number two, what is the total production uh, of power in the present day Pakistan? And what is the percentage of population which is still bereft of energy power in your country? More on Iran, Pakistan, India gas pipeline. And what are the impediments, hurdles, obstacles in the way and thank the Pakistani demands and whatever it is? Okay, thank you very much. I want to take uh, one or two questions from, from the, the researchers. I'll come back to you, Mujisa, uh, from, the, uh, from the young researchers at the back. Uh, good evening. My name is Arjun Chavna. I'm a student of economics from the University of Delhi. Uh, my question is to Mr. Nanda. Uh, so we discussed all other forms of energy access and trade, but uh, we didn't hear anything on hydroelectric energy uh, trade, for example. And um, considering that there's so much of shared resources in terms of shared rivers that India and Pakistan have, what are the possible um, steps or options that two countries can take for hydroelectric cooperation? The last time we saw the Baglia Dam controversy, which created quite a storm because it apparently violated the Indus Water Treaty. So how is it that one can, keeping this treaty in mind, move forward and create cooperation and a hydroelectric system which actually benefits both countries? Good evening, this is Madhura Joshi from uh, Terry. Uh, the panelists have raised very pertinent points, but I was just hoping uh, if they could share some light also on uh, renewable energy cooperation potential that exists between the two countries, because we've focused a lot on the traditional energy resources over here. I just wanted to widen the debate a bit. Thank you. Thank you for broadening the discussion. Uh, Majid sir. Uh, nobody has mentioned CASA 1000, Central East South 1000. Probably I, yeah, yours was the best presentation. <laughs> Another thing is, my point is, because India backed out of IP, I, so it is now IP. And if India had not backed out, we would have been in a strong position in, in the American context. Unfortunately, it is no more IPI. Second, that is why TAPI is very important. 
the reason why I am saying is that as long as it goes to India, they will never stop for Pakistan, especially the northern, northern areas of Afghanistan who are more anti-Pakistan. So for us, it is very important that Tabi does not become tapped. Second point that I want to make is, uh, third point, sorry, coal gasification. This is an outdated 100-year-old technology. Uh, one idiot uh, scientist in Pakistan has been going around trying to uh, mess up with Thar. If, if, and uh, thanks to Allah, this damn thing is finished. Otherwise, our Thar coal, which Zubair Bhai is saying 175 or whatever billion, that is still underground. Coal gasification plant, according to the experts, that if we take gas, gasify one kilometer, it will mess up 60 kilometers of coal, uh, 60 mile radius. So for us, this is an option. The option we have is Bhatinda, Jamnagar, the refinery Jamnagar, and we need solar cooperation from India. This is something that you should look because this is where we are, we are ready to open our doors, you know. We want solar, because right now we are deficient in that. We don't have the economies of scale. We don't have the critical mass. This is what your people should think about it. Thank you. Uh, a, a, okay, okay, but very quickly, please. Very quickly, thank you, Chair. A uh, couple of points. Well, I, I agree with you about your analysis that, first of all, we need to take care of demand side management within our economies. But I'm not quite sure uh, about the second part of your analysis. I do think that trade can play a major role while we parallel in parallel we also take measures for demand side management. I'm saying this because essentially in the whole context of South Asia, particularly in the context of India and Pakistan, the energy markets are in a disequilibrium situation, which you have rightly pointed out. So when we talk about disequilibrium, not in a static sense, but when we talk about disequilibrium dynamics in this market, then I think trade can play a major role in addressing the problems of disequilibrium dynamics in this market. That's my number one point. Second, very quickly, I'm surprised that none of you have uh, talked about at great length about the potentiality of uh, solar energy. I think uh, if you look at the geography of South Asia, we can have a very significant, very vibrant regional solar grid. All the way from Northeast India to Bangladesh to Nepal, mainland India, Afghanistan and Pakistan, sorry, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And a large part of our demand, we are yet to estimate fully the potentiality of solar energy in this region. A large part of our demand can be made by solar in future because the cost of producing solar energy is coming down very rapidly and it is going to be much less than coal powered or gas powered energy in the future. Thank you very much. So the panel has uh, about a minute each. Uh, should we start? Thanks. Actually, many questions relate to uh, my presentation. I don't know one minute would be enough. Uh, okay, uh, Gwadar project, I okay. did not know. Yeah, it's operationalized and corrected, but uh, I know it was under construction. Uh, electricity in, in Pakistan, yes, there might be a uh, chairman's question, but you know, the, the issue here is that Indian power is relatively cheaper because we are coal based. Now, in Pakistan, situation is that you would not have uh, more of domestic gas. You have, say, uh, you know, uh, you know, got the limit. Hydropower would mean more of investment, which you have not done. Uh, so, more power means more of oil import for Pakistan. So, no, that that is a constraint. Afghanistan, I talked about it. Uh, Kasa project, I talked about it. Uh, you know, so you know that is how uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia will be connected to India and rest of South Asia. So, uh, that is there. Uh, hydroelectric power, uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, Pakistan has enough unutilized hydro hydroelectric power, but, you know, uh, it's relatively more investment incentive, so that why, that's why they did not go for it. But if they open up, you know, I, I guess many Indian uh, uh, companies would be interested in, in investing there. In Indian case, it is relatively more utilized. We, 
we have got approximately 50% of our hydro potentially realized. In Pakistan's case, it is much lesser, maybe some 20%, 23%. Yeah. Uh, then, yes, uh, yeah, Buckley Hair Dam is a different issue, so you know that's okay. Renewable energy, solar power, uh, yes, there is huge potential, but India is also on the learning curve. India has not really done uh, really huge, but you know, we have got a plan to have 100 uh, gigawatt per electricity, you know, so if we go along that line, that can be shared. Gasification, yeah, uh, you know. I understand this is, there are controversies and, you know, uh, questions about it, but, you know, India has planned to go gasification. So Pakistan doesn't have to take it if India finds it is creating problem, problems. So if everything goes well, you can think of getting it. Uh, IPI pipeline becoming IP, but the problem is that nobody is going to, nobody is interested in showing interest, you know, in, in funding that project. So you are actually uh, quite stuck with that. Uh, Bipul, uh, you don't have to have solar power grid. If you have solar power generated, the existing grid can help. So, uh, you know, you don't have to distinguish between solar grid or, uh, you know, uh, other grid. So, but that is a feasible option, surely. Thank you. Thank you. The only, uh, the only point which I would like to react after hearing the whole day and including the point <coughs> which you raised about the trust deficit. I mean, people who are liberal and educated like us, who are sitting all here, are all converted people. But if you ask the man on the street, the trust deficit uh, continues to remain as a big bottleneck. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, f uh, first of all, to your point, you said that India backed out from India, Pakistan, uh, Iran, Pakistan, India, Pakistan. There is no truth in it. Uh, number two, you said about TAPI, about Turkmenistan, Afghanistan pipeline. No, there's no question of backing out. It's under work. And in fact, you know, now the efforts are being made to take it to the, to, the, to, the, to the next stage. Because one thing is very clear, unless and until India is part of Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline, that pipeline is not going to happen. Never, ever. Number one, TAPI, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline will become a reality only and if India is a part of it. Because these projects are huge projects. These projects cannot be constructed only with high emotions. You need serious amount of money. Here you're talking about seven, eight, nine billions of dollars. And, and a market. And mar that market is, of course, Pakistan, but the bigger market is India. And therefore, it is important we look at these projects in a more scientific way. And secondly, uh, very quickly about cooperation. In my own view, solar, renewable, we can talk of 110 things. But I think if we really are looking uh, for some kind of energy cooperation between India and Pakistan, it has to be basically to start with either TAPI or IPI. If we, and my personal view is the focus should be on TAPI. If TAPI, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India becomes a reality, that is going to change the landscape forever. And the landscape change will be so big the agenda for cooperation between India, India and Pakistan will not no longer be set by politician, it will be set by people. Because that is going to change the landscape where people will see the benefit, people will enjoy the dividends, and I think that, will, that is what is going to change. So focus on that, let's stop blame game. Is India, without India, TAPI is never going to happen. If you think that IPI will become a reality just by being ipped, never going to happen. TAPI, only TAP, this TAP is never going to be on. Thank you. Well, thank you. Quick points. Uh, I think the three models which we have developed over the last many years, uh, the bilateral arrangement, the power pool arrangement, and the third, the arrangement on the wheeling facility. We have two very significant examples on the bilateral, Bhutan and now Bangladesh, and they are breakthroughs, right? And we are now trying to get one or two projects in the remaining two models on the power pool model and of course on the on the on the willing model and if you are able to put just one small project at the ground level make them realize show them as a kind of a demonstrative projects i think that's going to make a huge difference in the entire energy cooperation in south asia we are keenly looking forward to that and i'm sure it's going to happen in the course of the next five to eight years thank you very much thank you uh, let me conclude this session with a, with a one brief comment on the broader question of India-Pakistan trade. 
I've been working on this for the last 20 years, and numerous reports, numerous conferences, etc. Uh, I was telling this earlier to, to Ishrat. Um, I was asked by a very frustrated businessman uh, before I came to this conference, Dr. Saab, one more conference of India, Pakistan trade, kuch hota to nahi hai, why are you doing this? I said, how do I answer him? And I happened to see uh, uh, Mughal -e Azam, the film, and there's a beautiful line which Akbar, played by Prithvi Raj, says to Anarkali, played by Madhubala. Anarkali, Salim tumhe marne nahi dega, aur hum tumhe jine nahi dege. <laughs> so I said, dekhe ji, vested interests trade hone nahi dege, civil society or economists trade ko hone se rok de nahi dege. So let's just continue with that spirit <laughs> and let's continue to engage with, the, with each other to make sure that sooner or later that trust deficit does get addressed and the people of South Asia really begin to benefit because because there is no there is no lose lose in this in this game everybody benefits when india and pakistan trade and country is an important country that mindset has to change that nothing is going to happen to india yet nothing is going to happen to pakistan or afghanistan or iran uh, i think the point which you're making is Chair, the point you're making is, sir, sir. I think, I think we should conclude this session uh, as Chair, as you're, what you're suggesting is we need to wage peace. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We just need a couple of minutes uh, to change the name plates and then we're ready for the next session. Just all of you to please sit down. And may I also request the panelists to come here. Thank you. May I now request Dr. Risha Judge Aluwalia to chair this session. Very good evening, friends. I know that uh, you've had a full day of uh, discussions and, and debates, and uh, from what I could see towards the end, there is still a long way to go. We have not resolved the, the many questions in our mind. And what better way to move to dinner than have a special address. And we are really very fortunate to have with us uh, Mr. Abdul Basit, Pakistan's High Commissioner to India. Uh, I'm very thankful to you, High Commissioner, for agreeing to spare the time and deliver this address. <coughs> and after uh, you have given your address, we have a uh, number of uh, stalwarts from the business world in, uh, on both sides. Uh, so I would like to welcome all of you on the panel. Uh, two key issues <coughs> on which we would like to hear perspectives from leading business persons from both countries, uh, I would just like to uh, 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 state, one, that a substantial part of the trade normalization process has been completed. What can businesses do to realize this potential? How can we actually make 
trade normalization happen? In the last two years, increase in trade has not been very much. What can the private sector do to enhance trade? How can we move our governments to help realize this normalization process? Um, and in particular, what role the businesses can do in taking this process of trade normalization forward. So we will first hear from the government representative and then we would like to hear perspectives from both sides of the border on how we can make this happen. So with that little introduction, may I invite High Commissioner Pasi to give his special address. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Isha Adhuvalia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good evening. Andaze baya garche mera shauk nahi hai, shayad ke tere dil mein utar jaye meri baat. Since I have been given 10 minutes, uh, so let me very quickly uh, make a few points uh, which I think are relevant from Pakistan's uh, perspective. <coughs> uh, first, Pakistan has always uh, wanted to have a normal relationship with India, uh, but on the basis of uh, mutual respect and uh, sovereign equality. Uh, luckily, I was uh, in Pakistan last week, uh, also had an opportunity to call on Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and I can tell you that he reiterated uh, his vision uh, of peace for development and development for peace. Uh, and he uh, instructed me that, we, that I should continue uh, making uh, sincere efforts towards uh, normalizing our bilateral relationship. Second, let us admit that uh, there is deep distrust between our two countries. And this distrust has its genesis in the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. All other issues, including Siachen, Sar Creek, and even problems in returns in bilateral trade, they all resulted from or stemmed from the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. So now the question is can you put that dispute on the back burner and focus only on trade and cultural relations? Because there is one, there is an approach which suggests that if we put hard issues on the back burner and try to promote trade and cultural relations, perhaps that will help us to uh, build a conducive atmosphere. And then, at some uh, stage down the road, we would be able to address difficult issues. Now, our experience tells us that uh, no matter how hard we try uh, in areas like trade and uh, cultural relations or other, you know, the soft areas, there are inherent limitations uh, to what we do in these areas. The mutual distrust does not allow us or even allow our efforts vis-a-vis -vis expanding bilateral trade beyond a certain point. In a relationship where I, as Pakistan High Commissioner, cannot leave New Delhi without prior permission of the NEA, 
And my counterpart in Islamabad cannot leave that city and can't even go to uh, Islamabad, uh, Rawalpindi or Murray. Uh, you can imagine how serious the problem is between our two countries. So this, in, from our perspective, <coughs> leaves us with no choice but to address these difficult issues as well. And when people say to put the Jammu and Kashmir dispute on the back burner, they perhaps forget that this dispute is not about territory. It's about millions of Kashmiris who have been struggling to realize their aspiration. We in Pakistan do not know as to how we can put their aspirations on the back burner. So it's a question, I leave it uh, for your consideration. The third point which I would like to make is that both Pakistan and India agree on a holistic approach to resolve our problems. We have a composite dialogue uh, under which there are eight segments and we discuss all the outstanding issues or the or other issues as well like Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Siachin and Sarkri, terrorism, security issues, economic relations and so on and so forth. And Pakistan fully understands that uh, we cannot achieve progress on all these issues in all these areas simultaneously. Perhaps we can uh, make more progress uh, in achieving more when it comes to trade and economic relations. It would take perhaps longer when we would deal with issues like Jammu and Kashmir or Siachen and Sar Creek. But we are fully cognizant of this. But that does not mean that we should not engage with each other or put any issue on the back burner. I think fundamental is that we need to address or approach all these issues with the sincerity and seriousness of purpose. If we do that, then I, we in Pakistan strongly feel that we can uh, resolve our problems amicably. Now there is also uh, an argument is made, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that if we have more and more trade, more and more cultural relations, uh, that will help us to create a positive environment wherein it would be possible for the two countries to uh, discuss difficult issues. But if you look around, uh, in the last 20, uh, 10 years or so, the bilateral trade, uh, trade between Pakistan and India has increased many fold. Uh, at present, uh, the volume of trade is around $2 billion. But what we have seen is that as the bilateral trade increased, we have also witnessed hardening of India's position on Jammu and Kashmir. As evident in the cancellation of uh, Foreign Secretary's meeting in Islamabad, uh, which was scheduled uh, for August 25th last year. So I do not know how valid is this argument that uh, if we move forward on uh, in areas of trade and culture, uh, things would perhaps uh, uh, be easier to resolve the, the, core, the hard issues. My fourth point would be that uh, no economic or trade relation 
uh, can be sustained if it is one-sided. Uh, we need to have an economic activity on the basis of a level playing field and which also generates interdependence.